In this video, I'm going to be showing you Portkey's AI Gateway, which is a way that you can simplify your LLM integrations within your applications. Let's say you want to interact with Mistral, you want to interact with Perplexity, and you want to interact with OpenAI. What AI Gateway allows you to do is to have, first of all, a universal API. Now, what do I mean by that? That allows you to query the model in the same way. All you have to do is swap out the model as well as the API key, and then the response schema that you get back is going to be consistent across all of the different models. So say if you were to integrate this yourself, you'd have to deal and contend with multiple different schemas and multiple different vendors on how they set up their inference APIs. One thing that really stands out with a gateway is the number of AI providers that are supported. So you have OpenAI, Anthropic, Azure OpenAI, Cohere, AnyScale, Google Palm, Google Gemini, Together AI, Perplexity, Mistral, AWS Bedrock, Azure ML, BYO LLM, and you have framework support for Langchain and Llama Index within their Python version of their libraries. Now, the next thing that AI Gateway allows you to do is it allows you to create a simple and semantic caching layer. That caching layer is helpful for a number of different reasons. It helps you save on your LLM costs by not having to continually query that LLM, especially if it's the same query, and then also the inference speed. So instead of having to wait for the LLM for that response, especially if there's something with a larger token count, that can really help the latency within your application. Another great feature that's built into a gateway are fallbacks. So what fallbacks allow you to do is say for whatever reason there's an error from OpenAI when you're querying it, it will allow you to specify another model for if there is an error on an endpoint, it will go ahead and try a different model. So say in a scenario you want to use OpenAI's GPT 3.5, and if for whatever reason there's an error on that endpoint, you want to go ahead and default back to something like Anthropic's Claude, if you'd like. Somewhat similar to fallbacks is there is also the ability to have automatic retries. What automatic retries allow you to do is to query that model multiple times if there is a failure. So on certain status codes, you can go ahead and specify that you want to retry that query X number of times. The other nice thing that a gateway allows you to do is to load balance. So if you have a number of different models within here, you can go ahead and specify you want a certain portion of your queries to go to said models. And you can go ahead and specify the amount of weight that you want to have towards each model. This can be useful in a number of different ways. Just to name a couple, say if you're using a service where you're hosting your own model and you're incurring costs by actually running that GPU within the cloud on the service that you have, this is one mechanism that you can use to make sure that you don't overwhelm that GPU that you're using. This could be useful is say you have an allotment of free credits across different services and you want to make sure that you're trying to use up those credits before actually incurring costs. This is a way that you can load balance that out across a number Number of different models. Next up, a really cool feature is canary testing. Say if you want to try out a new model, but you don't want to roll it out to all of your users, you want to test it out on only a segment of your users. So what canary testing allows you to do, similar to load balancing, is you can specify a particular weight for how many queries are sent to a different LLM. So say if you want to test out something like Llama 2 on any scale, you can go ahead and specify that you want 5% of your traffic routed to any scale or perplexity and try out that inference API. You can go ahead and route a certain amount of traffic to a particular model. So while it sounds just like load balancing, largely it is. It's using the same technique as load balancing, but it's really just to achieve a different outcome. And finally, one of my favorite features is the ability to create virtual keys. So Portkey's virtual key system allows you to securely store all of your different LLM keys within one place. So I'm constantly having to log into different services, depending on the videos that I'm creating. And sometimes I'm limited in the number of API keys that I can use. And I'm constantly having to log into all of these different GUIs, whereas this allows me to have one platform where I can go in, store, and reach for all my API keys. There's also an added security benefit of this where, say if you're within an organization and you don't want to share an open key directly and you want something that's put in front of that, this is a way that you can have that virtual key and manage that. So the other nice thing with Portkey is there is an open source repository which you can check out and easily install and get started with your own server on routing everything through that. Or you can use their platform that has a generous free tier that you can go ahead and try it out. Now there's a number of nice things with their free tier, not just the AI gateway. There's also a full stack LLM observability platform that allows you to track different things like number of tokens used or the cost or latency request and the unique users that your application is using. So a whole host of things that are built in within the platform. So I'd encourage you to make an account and check this out. To give you a quick look on the observability platform, this is just a quick look on sample data. So you can go ahead and look through here and see the different things that could be interesting to you. So say if you have a lot of errors on a particular model, 
model, or if you want to track cost or the number of tokens that you're using, that's all built within here. The other nice thing with their platform is if you want to track whether there's errors or whether the cache is being hit for particular queries or how long things are taking, you can go ahead and at the level of each query and what is happening on each query itself. Now, there is also the ability to create prompts here. So if you put in the different environment variables for the various services that you're using, you can go ahead and use this like a playground that you would on OpenAI. But the only difference here is you can interact with a host of different models and services all within one platform. The other nice thing with the platform is there is this nice interactive GUI where you can go ahead and create a config. So say if you want to play around with how to set up the schema, this gives you a nice area where you can go ahead and make sure that it's a valid schema for what's all ultimately going to be passed as the configuration object. A way that this is useful is say you just put in an invalid schema, maybe you don't put it in the right place, or maybe you forget to put a comma or something like this. This will go ahead and start to guide you down the path of what's actually acceptable and how you can correctly query the AI gateway. And then to make a virtual key, like I mentioned earlier on in the video, you can just go to the virtual key tab, click create, select the model that you'd like to use, put in your API key. And once it's created, you can go ahead and see that within here, you you have your example key that you can go ahead and copy and you can use this API key that routes through the port key platform to leverage that open AI key or whatever key that you end up choosing within here. Right, so I'm going to go ahead and show you an example on how you can get started within bun or node.js. So you can go ahead and start a new project. You can just bun init and then you can get that package.json all set up. And then once you have that set up, then you can go ahead and bun or npm install or key i and v. Then once that's set up, you can go ahead and touch dot env and that's where we will put all our environment variables. I'm going to show you an example with OpenAI and Perplexity. All that you have to do is create a new secret key. You can name it something like port key if you want. Then once you have that key, you can go ahead and create that secret key. So you can give it a name, make sure you specify OpenAI, and then just paste in the key there. So now that we have that, we see that we have our virtual key here. You can go ahead and copy that key. And within your environment variable, you can just go ahead and paste it here. So in this case, I named it OpenAI underscore virtual underscore API underscore key. And then you can put in the value right here. Then once that's all set up, you'll be able to reference that virtual key within the configuration here. So once you have at least one environment variable, all you have to do is within their interface, you can go ahead and copy your API key right from the bottom left corner here and paste it within your environment variable. Once you have your port key and a virtual key, you can go in within here and specify your virtual key in two ways. You can pass it within the configuration of when you establish port key, or you can pass it in when you perform something like a chat completion as well. Both will work. If you pass it in within the chat completion, this one is going to take precedence. If I go ahead and query this, just like I'd use something like the OpenAI SDK, and I bun run, you'll see that I have a test here and it returned correctly. And I did want to point out the configuration. So that object that you could just copy from their GUI here, once you have it all set up, you can go ahead and paste it in here. So say if you want to have a caching layer where you want to specify the number of retries or fallbacks or canary or all of those things that I initially showed you, that's going to be where you specify them. Now, I just wanted to show you what this looks like to have a second example. So in the first example, I'm using GPT 3.5 Turbo. So OpenAI's endpoint, I'm specifying in my virtual key. Now, if I want to use something like Perplexity's API, I can go ahead, specify the model, put in my virtual key that I have for Perplexity, and you can go ahead and query that as well. Just looking at these two, you can see how easy it is to switch from one model to another model. This will save you a ton of time where you don't have to write different parsing logic to handle all of the different schemas for all of the different model vendors. This will do all of that heavy lifting and normalizing of the data for you where it's consistent on how you query it, as well as how the data is returned. Turn. Now, the last thing I wanted to show you is the logs within their platform, which can be super handy. So just to give you a glimpse for that query that I sent where I'm saying this is a test, you can go ahead and open that particular log. You can see how long it took, how much it cost. You can see the response. And then the other nice thing is you can also see the caching status. So if I go back here and I make another query with the same message and I head back over to the logs, you'll see that it pops up right here and we see that now we have a cache hit. So instead of having that same message being routed again to OpenAI and incurring that cost. Now you can see I'm no longer incurring a cost from the LLM for the tokens that were used. You can also see that the request time for that response was significantly less than the original one. So 126 milliseconds 
versus 576 milliseconds from the LLM. So while this is a small example, let's say if I say, explain quantum mechanics to me in 10 sentences, and I go ahead and run this. Now we know just from specifying that we want 10 sentences, that this is going to take a considerable amount of time longer than that initial query. But now once we have that response, we can go ahead and check this out. We can see that it took almost nine seconds to complete. But now if I go ahead and run that one more time, if we look at the request timing for the new response, we can see that instead of almost nine seconds, we have 30 milliseconds, which is almost 800 X increase in latency. So the faster your application, obviously the more enjoyable it's going to be for users to use, and it can potentially save you a ton of money on not having to incur all of those additional LM costs, especially if it's an application mm -hmm. where you don't need variability between the responses that you send back to the user and you're able to send back the same response. This is something that might be particularly useful for your application where you can have more consistent responses, especially for common requests. There's a ton of other features within the platform that I'd encourage you to make an account and go ahead and check out. Hopefully you found it useful. If you did, please like, comment, share, and subscribe. And otherwise, until the next one.